Royal Rife, the man who cured all disease in 1931. They did that with sound and resonance and frequency, spectacular uh, achievement in curing cancer in the wards. Um, this is his handwritten book that I had the privilege of seeing. It's in a, in a, in a private library in Sedona, Arizona. There's about 700 pages in there, I think, and they are page after page with his own handwritten frequencies for all the different diseases. So I'm thinking to myself, where do these guys that come up with the other, all the other Rife machines that you find on the market, where did they get their frequencies from when his, his original handwritten book is in this library in Sedona? Where did they get their frequencies from? I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying that what's probably happening is that people are figuring out what the frequencies are that cure cancer and the prime resonance frequencies that destroy pathogens. I know I said I wouldn't digress or get off the track, but... One of my biggest, most exciting obsessions at the moment, and if there are people in this room that can do this, please go away and do this. You know that honey lasts forever. It doesn't go off. It's not affected by viruses, bacteria, pathogens. It's, it's, it's one of those miraculous things. Apparently, the reason that honey does that is because of the frequencies of the bees' wings when they're building the honeycombs and when they're creating and bringing in the honey. So it's a frequency of the bee's wings that creates the hexagonal structure of honeycombs. It's also interesting is that the hexagonal structure is a structure of, of, of oxygenated and structured water that cures disease, cancer. I can talk a lot more about this, but again, another rabbit hole. So this is really important. I believe that if we can find, if, if any one of you can go and record the frequency of bees in a beehive, the buzzing of the bee's wings, and you take that frequency to a lab, a biochemistry lab, and you expose a petri dish of viruses, bacteria, and fungus to the frequency of the bee's wings, I suspect that that frequency will kill the bacteria. Please go ask your friends to do this. And maybe this is a very quick and cheap way to kill cancer and disease and everything else. So uh, let me know once you've done that. Let's tell everybody. <laughs> George Lakovsky's multiple wave oscillator um, is a spectacular device. Um, in fact, my friend Stephen Ross that has that book in Sedona, uh, Royal Rife's book, he also has uh, many other incredible books and also has a, a multiple wave oscillator with which he cured his father, listen carefully, he cured his father of quadriplegia. You don't cure people of quadriplegia, right? His father was admitted with quadriplegia into the hospital in the USA. Six weeks later, he walked out on crutches. The way he treated him is every day he walked in there with a little small handheld portable multiple wave oscillator from George Lakovsky and treated him for about 45 minutes up and down his spine, after which he exposed him to color light therapy for another hour. He did this for four weeks, six weeks. His father walked out on crutches. I saw the hospital report. It says, Mr. So-and-so ex exhibited a remarkable recovery. That's it. It's spectacular. They just won't go there. <laughs> they will not be you know, engaged in any explanation. In 2011, Anthony Holland, this is now in a TED talk, show us which frequencies kill cancer cells. Very briefly, Okay, he tells us between 100,000 hertz and 300,000 hertz kills cancer cells. And he shows us in the TED Talk. When I saw this, I went, okay, wow, that's it. Whew, the cancer game is over. Thank you. No, it's not. This is how powerful these guys are. They shut you down. They stop you. They prevent you from getting this stuff out. These are the first videos taken. We showed these videos to our friends in the biology department. They said they hadn't seen anything quite like it. Seems to be a new phenomenon. These organisms are being shattered by our electronic signals. This is a harmless organism, almost friendly, a little blepharisma. And normally they're very fast swimmers, but when you approach a frequency to which they are vulnerable, they begin to slow down, then they stop, and then they begin to disintegrate within about three minutes. So 
So first we attack pancreatic cancer. Take a good look at this slide because the next one will look quite different. After we treat these cells, they change their shape and size and they begin to grow long rope-like structures out the sides. They look something like antennas. I call them bioantennas for biological antennas. It's as if the cancer cells are trying to tune in to our signal. We now know that cancer is vulnerable between the frequencies of 100,000 hertz and 300,000 hertz. So now we attack leukemia cells. Leukemia cell number one tries to grow a copy of itself, but the new cell is shattered into dozens of fragments and scattered across the slide. Leukemia cell number two then hyperinflates and also dies. Leukemia cell number three then tries to make another cancer cell. The new cell is shattered and the original cell dies. You got the gist of that, right? No need to see any more. You can go look up more of this for yourself. Sound levitates. Just an example how sound can levitate things. But this is not how the ancients levitated 10 ton, 20 ton, and 1,000 ton blocks or mountaintops in ancient times. This is just sound pressure waves in a confined chamber but it at least gives us an idea that sound can levitate things. I'll talk about how SASER technology is the tool most likely used for levitating and manipulating and cutting and drilling and so forth. I spoke to David Deke that made this video. He lives on Long Island. He told me they were just amazed how sensitive it was, how they could, by the most subtle frequency change, they could make these things do pretty much anything they wanted, tumble, bob up and down, spin, he said they had a great deal of fun with us. Listen to the subtle frequency change and it begins to spin. But again, this is not how you levitate, you know, very heavy rocks. There's a whole different technique for that. John Keeley did the same. He levitated giant rocks. He crushed giant rocks uh, into to fine talcum powder with sound frequencies. He drilled holes with sound frequencies. He levitated stuff. So much more we can talk about John Keeley. Boy, I actually think that he was probably one of the big inspirations for Nikola Tesla, John Keeley. He did so much. Peter Davy was boiling water with sound in New Zealand until he died several years ago. The problem with this, luckily he confined it to his little, to that little uh, bubble at the, that ball at the end of his, of his device. Because if you create a frequency that boils water and you just allow that to escape, you're going to explode your body, right? Because our bodies are made up of water. So just a warning, if you want to think, if you think you want to go and find a frequency that boils water, make sure you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to kill yourself and your family. Um, and all, of, all the people around you. Magnetrons obviously generate huge amounts of energy, and that's just sound. It's a resonant cavity magnetron. Resonant cavity magnetron that's used in laser beams, laser technology, microwaves, all use magnetrons for that technology. Sound acts as a close cloak of invisibility. Uh, this, there's so much new information about this. Uh, you know, this opens a whole new chapter in debate. There's very advanced new sound cloaking technology right now available. Uh, this plastic 3D acoustic pyramid acts as a as an acoustic cloak, make things, make things invisible when you put it underneath it, when you expose that pyramid to specific sound frequencies. And that pyramid is reminiscent of what? Is reminiscent very strongly of Eastern architecture. And when you start looking at this Eastern architecture, once again, you got this resonant thing going up into the sky with a needle and some antenna pointing out the, up at the sky. There was other stuff going on here as well, but I suspect that Maybe if you take a bunch of monks and you put them inside the monastery with this weird roof, like that pyramid that makes things invisible when you, uh, in, inside it, if you put a bunch of monks in there and you make them chant, maybe at some frequency of chanting, that whole monastery becomes invisible. 
and just is not there. So you got the army marching on you. You just get everybody in the monastery. You begin to chant, and suddenly you're gone. And the army just walks right past you, nothing to see here. That's a great way to avoid confrontation. Sound creates hurricanes. In 2003, these guys lodged a patent to create hurricanes with sound. And then here's another one. Sound creates supercluster galaxies. When I said earlier, the lower the frequency, the larger the cymatic shape. Now you've got a frequency that's 57 octaves lower than middle C rumbling away from a supermassive black hole in the Perseus cluster in the key of B-flat, <laughs> creating a supercluster galaxy. And it's amazing. This is a, apparently an image of it. I like the one on the left because when you watch Hans Jenny's Cymatics documentary, that looks identical to the images of lycopodium powder on a metal plate with sound frequencies on it. This is like lycopodium powder that's creating supercluster galaxies. This is insane. So you start to get the, the, the idea of as above, so below. There's no end. This is what really disturbs me. The fact that we could put out fire with sound, and yet this has not been empl employed or used anyway. Why? Because it's not good for business. Pain, suffering, damage is good for business. It keeps expanding the money need and the supply for money. Remember, if we, the moment we stop the growth and the need for money, the entire global financial system collapses. And so we have you know, inflation and, and, and interest and all this because that's the only way the current money system can carry on operating. And uh, if you want to learn more about this, watch one of my Ubuntu uh, workshops on, on the internet. Um, and this is just spectacular. These kids develop this little resonator that puts out a fire. Five seconds. Count it from the moment they put it down to the frying pan to when the fire is out. Five seconds. Imagine the fire trucks arriving at a building, burning building. The ladders go up. And instead of fire hoses, a bunch of speakers get switched on and put out this frequency. That fire in the building will be out in literally a few, few seconds or a minute. The entire fire, everywhere, because it res it'll resonate right through the building. But that's not going to happen, because that's going to save a lot of money and a lot of pain. We're both graduating from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at George Mason University uh, this coming May. Uh, we're here, we're just going to test out our, our device that we use that uses sound frequencies to extinguish flames. I, I see this device being applied to a lot of things. First off, I think in the kitchen, it could be on top of a stove top. Um, but eventually, I'd like to see this applied to maybe swarm robotics where it'd be attached to a drone. And that would be applied to forest fires or even building fires where you wouldn't want to sacrifice five seconds. Uh, human life. Fire was out in five seconds. <laughs> Sound energizes the air we breathe, and this is how we actually oxygenate our bodies and our lungs, and or through our, our lungs, the blood in our veins and our arteries, rather. Because as you breathe, the sound, that, the air that you breathe makes a bloody noise, and it goes into your lungs, and it goes into the smaller and smaller orifices as it moves into your lungs. So it speeds up and speeds up and speeds up, and it goes higher and higher and creates these frequencies, and it's the energy and the sound of this, the air that you breathe that actually energizes the oxygen in the air. So that oxygen is buzzing as it's moving faster and faster. By the time it reaches the alveoli, and it goes from the alveoli into your artery, uh, in, into, sorry, yeah, from the lungs into the arteries, that oxygen in the air is buzzing and energized from the sound. And that's when it goes into your blood, and it's used in the blood, and it's stripped of the vibrating energy. And when it's stripped of the vibrating energy, you breathe it out again, and it just repeats that cycle. And that's how we uh, energize the oxygen that we breathe. That don't teach you this at medical school. This never, ever gets discussed at medical school, because they actually don't know this. I think they don't, don't even know this. In 2011, Luc Montagnier spontaneously generated DNA by exposing a tube of water to certain sound frequencies that had the frequencies of a DNA in it and constituted DNA in, in, in an empty test tube. If you can create DNA in an empty test tube with sound, 
Now you start understanding how we can start cloning other species and other creatures just by sound and vibration. And then obviously sonoluminescence, the star in a jar. God said, let there be light. A bubble with brilliant light inside a body of water. Is it possible that all the star systems that we see out there are actually just giant bubbles of light in a never-ending mass of water? I don't know. Sound is the ultimate source of free energy. Nikola Tesla knew this, and I believe that this is how he constructed his energy device because he knew that the earth rings like a bell. He talks about it. He tapped into the sound of the earth just like the guys that built the stone circles tapped into the sound of the earth. And he used that. He could, he could transmit that and use that um, whichever way he wanted. 